Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Beyond Standardized Test, Using Performance Assessment in College Admissions. Thanks for joining us today for our 75-minute webinar. While we give a few minutes to make sure everyone gets logged in and online, how about if those who are here use the chat function to let us know who is on? You can list your name, your organization, state, or region, whatever's most comfortable for you. You can also engage in discussion in the chat throughout the webinar. We'll be listing resources in the chat function as well. And if you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Thanks for great. Thank you. I love the I love that you guys are populating the chat. Um, I'd also like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded. A video recording along with a summary of the webinar content will email, be emailed to you in a few days. The slides are currently available at the link in the chat box. Very excited today that we have almost 700 folks registered. Today's webinar will examine the use of performance assessments in secondary education and in admissions, specifically at the City University of New York, CUNY. The webinar is being held as part of the Reimagining College Access Initiative, lovingly called RCA. It is a partnership with Education Council and Education First. We believe that high quality performance assessments, if organized in an easily reviewable form, could be used as an additional source of information about students' achievements and potential for post-secondary success in college admissions, as well as for placement decisions or advising. My name is Monica Martinez, and I am the Director of Strategic Partners, where one of the initiatives I support is the Reimagining College Access Initiative on behalf of the Learning Policy Institute. I'm relatively new to the Learning Policy Institute, so I'm really excited about our being part of our first webinar. For those who have not heard of RCA, we began in 2017 when LPI with Education Council brought together a group of individuals and organizations to explore interest in and the value of using K-12 performance assessment in higher education admissions, placement and advising decisions to improve the quality and equity of these decisions by providing better information. Following this 2017 exploratory meeting, three task forces were created to shape the initiative. As this slide shows, through combination of task force meetings and convenings with a network of interested individuals and organizations over the last two years, a series of these specific recommendations were made aimed at achieving RCA's vision. One of these recommendations was to work through local and regional partnerships to pilot the use of performance assessment in higher education admissions and to identify technology-based tool or platform to capture student performance information. To facilitate this, Reimagining College Access Initiative partnered with the Common App application, also called the Common App. For those who may not know of the Common App, it is an undergraduate college admissions application that applicants may use to apply to any of more than 800 member colleges and universities in 49 states and the District of Columbia, as well as Canada, China, Japan, and many European countries. Given the familiarity and usage of the Common App among high school students as well as counselors, they've been great partners. Through Common App and the platform they use, SlideRoom, Applicants can upload performance assessment materials at the same time and in the same way as their other application components, background, personal statements, letters of recommendation, transcripts, thereby allowing admissions officers, admissions reviewers to assess and score their applicant files, including performance assessment. This way, we are not creating an additional barrier for students, but are using a platform that integrates the inclusion of performance assessment into the existing workflow of a student's application and reviewer scoring process. This year, we've been working with and learning from five higher education institutions in New England who have piloted the use of performance assessment in admissions and used Common App and SlideRoom as their application submissions platform through even though at least another 120 higher education institutions that are part of Common App are capable of doing this. There's also another 750 organizations and 1,000 academic programs on SlideRoom independent of Common App that are able to use this platform to submit performance assessments. We are excited to see 
and support the momentum around reimagining college access and success as a growing number of colleges are seeking more ways to recognize and encourage the development of student abilities that go beyond standardized test scores. We are proud to be working with a broad-based network of K-12 and higher education policy and practice leaders, including the National Association for College Admissions Counseling, NACAC, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, also called ACRO, State Department leaders, school network leaders like Linked Learning and Visions, the New York Consortium. We're also working with the Mastery Transcript Consortium, a growing network of public and private schools who are introducing a digital high school transcript that shows in detail evidence of what students have done, strengths, abilities, and academic history. The, co the Coalition for College, which created an application with a digital locker that students can use to apply to 150 colleges committed to access, affordability, and success and also Making Caring Common, a project of Harvard's Graduate School of Education and a coalition that is focused on reshaping the college admissions promote process to promote greater ethical engagement among aspiring students. You will see on the slide that is just a sample of the many partners who have brought us here today to reimagine college access. Moving on to our speakers. Our first speaker is Linda Darling Hammond, and she will talk about what is equitable and high quality performance assessment and their role in K-12 education and higher education. Linda is one of the nation's most prominent education researchers, president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, the lead partner for RCA, and president of the California State Board of Education. Our next speaker is Joanna Kurcharski. She will tell us about CUNY's pilot program to accept performance assessment as part of the admissions application and how they were integrated into the admissions process and decision. Joanna serves as the Associate Director of Admissions and the Recruitment for the City University of New York. City of University of New York serves at least 500,000 students through 25 two and four year colleges with almost 1800 degree programs. Our final speaker is Michelle Fine. She will share early findings on the impact of the pilot program at CUNY to use performance assessment in admissions for students who did not meet the minimum scores on the SAT. Michelle is a distinguished professor at the City University of New York Graduate Center. Her research includes the topics of social injustice and urban education, and she has received multiple awards for her scholarly contributions. Linda Darling Hammond will wrap up the session with some final thoughts, and we'll leave, it, leave time at the end of this webinar for Q&A. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to engage in discussion, you may click the chat button and type in the chat box at the lower right side of your screen. With that, we will start with Linda Darling Hammond, who will help everyone understand K-12 performance assessments and why they can help colleges and universities evaluate student admissions applications. So I'm thrilled to be able to talk about this question of what are performance assessments and why would we want them as part of the higher education admissions um, placement and advising process. And I wanna start by noting that uh, what higher education does in terms of admission both gives them a sense of who they may be admitting, but it also sends strong signals to K-12 education about what is valued and what is valuable. And therefore, it really has um, uh, influence on the curriculum and the teaching that occur there, uh, which is one of the reasons that performance assessments are an important part of this process. Performance assessments, um, simply put, are opportunities for students to demonstrate what they know and are able to do through actually doing it, not by choosing one answer out of five predetermined responses. Um, ideally, those are also opportunities for students to get iterative feedback and opportunities to revise their work uh, so that it becomes more and more proficient towards meeting uh, explicit standards. It can include open-ended problems, evidence-based analysis, uh, quite often different kinds of research investigations in different disciplinary areas, uh, exhibitions of learning where students um, show what they've learned in a variety of ways, present it sometimes to a jury of teachers and others from outside the school, and defense of their ideas in response to questions. The kind of intellectual work that we actually expect to see students able to do in college. And now I'm trying to make the screen move. Uh, so performance assessments uh, develop a wide range of cognitive skills as well as social and emotional abilities. Um, and I uh, put this little cover of Authentic Assessment in Action, which is a book that I did back in 1995, which includes 
some of the performance assessments we're going to hear about today that were being begun uh, that many years ago. We know that performance assessments can improve students' ability to analyze and synthesize information, use evidence, communicate in multiple ways, but they also um, require that students plan and organize themselves, manage their work, uh, that they encounter challenges and learn to be resourceful uh, and to persevere as they do complex work, uh, to collaborate in many cases, uh, and then to take and use feedback, which is a critical life skill, as well as developing a growth mindset as they iterate and evolve their work. Um, and what we've found uh, over many years of research on the use of such assessments is that they do, in fact, improve students' abilities to engage in higher order thinking, critical thinking, and to develop these uh, life skills, uh, as well as supporting their ability to demonstrate knowledge in other ways. The New York Performance Standards Consortium uh, is uh, the site of some of the most sophisticated um, performance assessments for graduation from high school in the country. Uh, they, uh, some of the schools began doing this work as early as the 1980s, but certainly since the early 1990s, the collaborative of schools uh, have been graduating students by portfolio uh, with performance tasks in English language arts, math, science, history, uh, often the schools uh, the 38 of them use um, performance assessments in world language, the arts, internships, and other things. These are tied to the standards of disciplinary inquiry um, in those fields, a scientific investigation, social science research paper, literary analyses, mathematical modeling. Um, they are undertaken uh, in a process over the four years of high school, uh, defended before a committee, much like a dissertation defense, uh, and uh, students learn to respond to a wide range of questions and inquiries and think deeply about their work. Um, the revision um, process uh, occurs in relation to those standards. Um, and uh, what we found in multiple studies over many years um, is that these young people, most of them from um, high poverty schools, uh, many uh, recent immigrants as well of uh, students of color are graduating from high school, going on to college, and succeeding and persisting in college at higher rates uh, than their more advantaged peers. Uh, and when you talk to them about what has supported their success in college, this experience is one of the things that they uh, will talk about as a critical piece of their ability to succeed. This is a little challenging to see, but, see, but when you get the report on which this is based, you will be able to see the rubrics for these tasks, they're called PBATs, performance-based assessment tasks. And this one happens to be for mathematics. If you can see along the left-hand column, uh, you'll see that the criteria have to do with problem solving, reasoning and proof, communication, drawing connections, and representation of the mathematical ideas. Uh, this other one is for experimental science. And you can see that the standards have to do with um, uh, the way in which uh, the material or the problem is contextualized, um, the, the experimental design, the ability to collect and organize and present data, analysis and interpretation of results, uh, the ability to revise the original de design, so this idea of iterative thinking, um, and then of course, um, the defense of the material itself. This kind of scientific investigation, by the way, is part of the assessment systems in many um, Australian states, uh, in the UK, in Singapore, and other places where um, the idea of assessment is to develop these critical thinking and performance skills. Uh, and so I'm going to pass the ball, uh, now that you know a little bit about the New York Performance Standards Consortium, um, to Joanne Kucharski. Um, the one point that I want to make as we are um, continuing this discussion of the work is that uh, these kinds of assessments for these students are not only a piece of information for college admissions, as you will hear, but they are also the way in which students grow up in an intellectual tradition and learn to use their minds well. Sorry, thank you, thank you, Linda. Thank you so much for grounding us in the research and giving us these examples. Um, we actually have a couple of follow-up questions for you, Linda, and we have time before moving on to our next panelist. 
And so the first question that we have is, um, how, how does using performance assessment in K-12 um, create a different approach to teaching and learning? Well, the approach is one that um, emphasizes depth of thinking and of inquiry. It creates the, uh, the, the disciplinary standards and facts are still taught. In fact, uh, this um, portfolio that we're talking about was mapped against all of the region's standards. Uh, when new standards came in in the early 1990s, I was actually leading the uh, Curriculum and Assessment Council in New York at that time. Uh, this portfolio had to demonstrate that students were learning every, what was in the standards um, and thereby got a waiver from the other region's exams uh, that were being used to measure in a, in a uh, more traditional way. Um, but what happens is that teachers are framing big questions and themes, helping students see the dilemmas, the problems, the questions, the inquiries, giving them the opportunities, sometimes in groups, sometimes individually, sometimes in a combination, to go deeply into those, to inquire, to use the mode of inquiry in the discipline to uncover the answers to meaningful questions to write those up, to present them orally, in writing, in graphic representations, sometimes in the math and science arenas through a variety of quantitative representations, uh, and then to apply that you know, in real world settings. What we know about this kind of learning is that it's both more student initiated, there's a lot more student agency, purposefulness, uh, students uh, are deeply engaged in their work uh, because it is their work, uh, and they are able to transfer what they've learned more effectively to other problems and situations and areas of knowledge in the future. Great, thank you. We actually, we actually have time for one more question, Linda. Um, what features of student performance, um, what features of student performance can performance assessments reveal that are useful for admissions? Well, when you think about what people want to uh, see students able to do in college, and I will say uh, truth in advertising, I was a graduate school professor at Columbia and Stanford for 30 years. So, you know, I've heard the discourse and seen the, uh, the needs. Uh, you want people who can think analytically, who can uh, engage in inquiry and research, who can write effectively, who can communicate effectively, who can weigh and balance evidence, who can use ideas to, uh, and knowledge to uh, promote answers and solutions to problems. Uh, all of these are the kinds of things that are developed in this kind of work. And you see the difference in the uh, ability of these students to engage in what the purpose of college really is when they've had this kind of experience um, throughout high school. Uh, as a college professor, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard folks talk about, oh, you know, students can't, you know, many of our students can't write, they can't think analytically. Um, that is not the complaint with students who've been through four years of high school education focused um, directly and intensely on the development of those abilities. Great. I, I, I'm going to ask you one more question, so I'm not going to take myself off video. Sorry, but we have time. Thank you for this extra time, Linda. But this question just came in. Is the idea that performance assessment would supplement or supplant standardized testing for college admissions? It could, you know, be used in any way that seems appropriate in a college. Um, many colleges uh, are now doing holistic review. Um, and I know uh, at the University of California system, we just went through a uh, a vote about the, the admissions process last week, there are 14 um, indicators in the holistic review system in the University of California, which in some cases are used very, very widely and deeply. So this could be one indicator um, in a si system of holistic review along with uh, a test score or more than one test score, you know, including international baccalaureate, um, advanced placement and other kinds of assessments. Uh, it depends on the, the college and its need. Of course, in some fields like art and architecture and music, uh, this kind of material has been submitted um, 
and, um, you know, in the application routinely and is heavily weighted uh, in the process. Um, depending on the size and shape of the university and its, and its framework, one might look at these kinds of indicators for um, students uh, in a uh, smaller group uh, along the margin of admissions uh, or in um, you know, the broader group. And one might look at different things. The tools that are being used that you introduced earlier, Monica, um, allow uh, people to decide where to go deep and what to look at. Uh, it is also true that uh, universities are beginning to use this kind of material for placement and uh, advising as well. And I think we should think of that whole continuum. Uh, but there's no one answer to the way in which uh, these assessments and others might be used um, in conjunction with one another. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate that. And, and I really appreciate the audience sending in those questions. So thanks very much. We will move on to our next speaker. And um, Linda will come back and, and wrap up our, um, our, our webinar today. But thank you for this question. So um, Joanna, as previously stated, she comes from City University of New York, where she works as the Director of Admissions for CUNY and has been part of this pilot program from its inception. Joanna's gonna share why and how a system as old and as large as City University of New York uses performance assessment as part of the admissions selection criteria. Thank you, Monica. So in this section of the presentation, uh, we'll discuss how CUNY and the New York State Consortium Schools engaged in an admissions pilot. I'll start by giving you a brief overview of CUNY describe our traditional admissions process, and then talk about how we reviewed applicants who participated in the pilot. So just a little bit of history, CUNY was founded in 1847 with a mission to provide access to a quality education to all students, regardless of background or means. So we are viewed as a vehicle for upward mobility for our students and as part of our mission, we continuously explore opportunities which focus on access and student success. So from opportunity programs to our nationally recognized ASAP model, there are many initiatives across CUNY that support our mission. CUNY consists of 25 colleges in New York City, and we currently serve 275,000 degree-seeking students across our campuses. Now our colleges include community colleges, four-year colleges, graduate and professional schools. Now let's transition to talking a little bit about application volume. CUNY receives a sizable number of applications. As of earlier this week, we received applications from over 86,000 freshman applicants, and those applicants have generated over 350,000 applications for our colleges. Separately, our transfer application has given us over 30,000 applicants and right around 67,000 applications for our colleges. Because we operate on a rolling admission basis, we expect increases um, in these numbers over the course of the summer. The admissions experience at CUNY is relatively streamlined. Students who are interested in applying to be considered would use the CUNY application. One application enables our first year students to apply to and receive decisions from up to six CUNY colleges. We also have a centralized university admissions office serving all of our undergraduate campuses in application completion, evaluation, and recommendation. In addition, each campus also has its own admission office primarily responsible for admitting and enrolling students. At all point of this process, all college admissions office have full access to view their applicant pools and take action. Now let's transition to the consortium pilot. So historically, students from the consortium would apply to the university much in the same way as the rest of our applicant pool. Over time, we started receiving feedback from educators that students who would have historically been admitted to CUNY were not being offered admission. This in part was attributed to our four-year institutions reducing the availability of remedial coursework 
and looking to college readiness benchmarks to determine readiness. These benchmarks were primarily determined by tests, standardized Regents exam scores, SAT tests, and ACT tests. Our partners at the consortium noted that with performance-based assessments, students were already engaging in a type of work that would be expected of them in a college setting and had the capacity to succeed in our most competitive campuses and programs, even if numerically they did not meet the benchmarks for admissions at some of our competitive campuses. These conversations were truly the catalyst for our pilot work, which started in the spring of 2015, looking at fall 2015 applicants and expanded for the fall 2016 cohort. Here is a general overview of the process. So first, high school administrators and teachers were asked to identify students who are a strong fit to our four-year programs, but did not meet the typical academic profile of a traditionally admissible student. Next, we asked for high school transcripts and SAT scores to be submitted for application completion purposes. Additionally, we asked all applicants to submit personal statements, letters of recommendation, and a sample performance assessment that they felt reflected their academic ability. Centrally, we completed and reviewed applicants holistically. So broadly speaking, we used personal statements and letters of recommendation to gauge non-cognitive attributes that could determine or that could contribute to student success. Specifically, we looked for signs of leadership, determination, and personal circumstances to shape our understanding of the students. Performance assessments were primarily used as evidence of an applicant's ability to clearly communicate ideas. We focused on grammatical execution, development of ideas, reasoning, and how well ideas were connected together. And then quite frankly, in all of this, we were reading for fit to see which campuses would best fit the needs and goals of our students. We ranked each component and submitted final applications to our colleges, giving them context about the type of work that all consortium students do and asking them to admit applicants as students of promise, even if they did not meet the traditional benchmarks that our campuses were seeking. So just a couple of notes here. Uh, performance assessments currently display as pass or fell on student transcripts, and some of the PBATs that we received were not accompanied by rubrics. Being that we did not engage faculty in the review of performance assessment, this to some extent limited our ability to gauge the accuracy of the work and left our staff lacking in the specifics of how each student was evaluated for competency. So this is an area that I think we could see some improvement and I'm excited to explore a little bit more. I also wanted to point out that the structure of this pilot in itself is quite significant. We asked students to participate if they felt like they were a strong fit to the university. We asked counselors and teachers to confirm to us that these students were capable of doing college level work. So by the time we received these files, we had strong reason to consider these applicants seriously and advocate on their behalf. So for implementation and expansion, and this is really quick, um, at the start of this review, our office did not have a platform that encouraged the supplemental submission of documents. Uh, since then, we've moved to a PeopleSoft product. And as a university, we've been able to scale asking students to submit supplemental documents. And so this has really made the process much simpler for us. As far as timeline, early submission of applications has been key to our success. It gave us the best opportunity to communicate our individual to our individual institutions early in the cycle, identify students of promise, and advocate on their behalf. And then finally, the one piece that we've been encouraging as, as we've got more familiar with performance assessments are more regular submission of rubrics. Throughout this process, we read work that had so much range, both in quality and subject matter. And since rubrics were not always included, 
it made it difficult to translate their work in a way that could be analyzed for trends and implemented at scale. So I think this is one of our takeaways is, is how do we potentially scale some of the information that we're seeing, especially since it's so promising. Um, so just to conclude, university-wide, we're seeing support that a student's work in high school serves as our strongest indicator um, of, of persistence in post-secondary setting. And that factors like self-regulation traits are important predictors of persistence. Our work with performance assessment complements what of our research shows us and quite excited to see further evolution of this work and also for you to see some of the results for students who chose to enroll with CUNY after participating. And with that, Monica, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I so appreciate what CUNY has done, the vision, the partnership with the consortium and how thoughtful you were in integrating this into the admissions process to support equity and student success. And you're really a North Star for the Reimagined College Admissions um, Initiative and so glad you made time for today. Before we move on um, to discuss the outcomes from this pilot, uh, we have a question from one of the audience members and they're asking specifically for an example of what you look at with a PBAT. So you talked about the fact that um, on the transcripts, it comes through as a pass or fail, but when you're actually mm -hmm. looking at a document, what are you looking at? And for, for the audience to know when it comes to the consortium specifically around the performance-based assessments they use, they're graded on a four-point scale, outstanding, good, competent, or needs revision. And of course, um, if it needs revision, it is because part of performance assessment is that you continuously to re revise your work, developing um, agency, as well as integrating feedback and becoming um, a better learner and to improve your skills. So there are four, um, four, there is a four point scale, but Joanna, when you receive a PBAT, what is the admissions office looking at? So we implemented over time, and I think there was some evolution here as we got familiar with the performance assessments. We really graded things on a three point scale to say like this exceeded our expectation, this falls in line with what we would expect from a high school student, or we felt that this particular assessment really needs some improvement and additional work. Um, when we were in receipt of the rubric scale that accompanied some of our performance assessments, but not all of them, we would use those as a guide to make decisions. And then quite honestly, we read the performance assessments anyway. Um, it, was, it was an educational model for us to be able to see how those two complemented one another. Um, in the absence of a rubric, we really focused on just the, the, the content and how well it was executed, um, the, the strength of the grammar, the development of ideas, as well as reasoning and connection of ideas. Um, again, because our undergraduate admissions process, at least from our central office, does not include um, review by faculty members. Um, there were portions of assessments where I, we simply didn't have the staff to, to be able to speak to some of the um, accuracy of the work, particularly as it related to, um, to math. Our, our favorite subject in admissions that I'm sure we could speak about. But, but, but broadly speaking, um, we were looking at the, the whole package holistically. Um, we were looking for feedback from the community and the partnerships that we were developing with the consortium schools. We were looking at the quality of the work and, and then to some extent also seeing whether or not that was a match with, with the GPA that, that the student had. It's fantastic. I mean, essentially, you guys were looking at content, you're looking at the school the student comes from, um, and, and you are looking at the rubrics when there is an assessment, but you're looking at student work, which is uh, really laudable by you all, and I know challenging for large admissions offices like yours. Um, I just have a quick follow-up question that we actually have a couple of minutes for that's very related to what you just talked about, and that was how did your admissions staff develop the capacity to review performance assessment materials. 
Um, you know, and you said like with math, sometimes that wasn't your, um, where your expertise was. I know at our next webinar, web, uh, MIT is going to share with us how they do it and how they involve faculty. But tell us how you mm -hmm. develop the capacity of the admission staff to review the performance assessment materials. Yeah, so, so I, you know, I, I wanted to emphasize here CUNY's mission, the, the performance um, uh, assessments that we reviewed and, and this pilot represents uh, one of many ways in which we advocate for students centrally. And so um, advocacy has um, always been a part of the work that we've done centrally with, with the university. Um, but, but broadly speaking, we um, we assessed for the information that we could reliably assess give, given our skill set. And so, so some of those benchmarks that I mentioned about the, um, you know, the applicant's ability to communicate ideas and, and the grammatical execution, those were things that we could agree upon as a team. Um, as, as far as the timing, so typically, um, the, the the pilot consisted of you know between 85 maybe 100 applicants and so that generated roughly uh, between 300 and 500 applications to our four-year institutions and so um, we, we had the capacity to be able to engage with that material more closely i i think again my thoughts are always with with scale how do we um, take some of this content and what other information can high schools provide to us um, so that we could use something like the rubric with a little bit more consistency to say if a student is outstanding in this particular measure, this is generally what this indicates for us as far as student success is concerned. So I think there's a little bit of work and development and, and opportunity there. Great. All right. So just kind of with Linda, I, I think I kind of lied to you. I am going to go ahead and ask one more question. Um, so you touched on the equity issue at the beginning of the conversation and just a little bit now in our conversation. But how do you and, and I know that um, Michelle will um, talk about this as well. But but how has using performance assessment really addressed some of the equity challenges CUNY was facing when you guys began this pilot really five years ago? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think a, a large piece that could be a, a separate and very lengthy conversation that I initially touched upon was the use of tests to determine access to college level courses. Um, as we were doing this work with our consortium schools, the university was, was also examining um, how to change some of our practices around placement into college level courses. And, and I think that this pilot just complemented that so nicely. Um, I mean, previously many of our um, students would need to take a standardized exam in order to prove that um, they could be successful in a in a college level course, and um, this type of work has supported the idea that in fact it's the it's the work that you're doing in high school that serves as your strongest predictor of post secondary success. Um, and not to say that the um, performance assessment was the only thing that we were doing, but but I think there were a lot of projects university-wide that, that supported this move um, to looking at student achievement in high school a little bit more closely and taking it a little bit more seriously than perhaps we had. Great. Thank you so much, Joanne. I really appreciate your perspective. And it really almost ends where Linda ended around the role of holistic admissions. And how do you integrate this in holistic admissions? And much like what University of California may be able to do, it's around student work. And so I really appreciate those comments and I'm sure we'll have more questions for you at the end of this webinar. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next panelist, uh, Michelle Fine. So certainly uh, last but not least at all, Michelle comes to us from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, where she and her colleague, Karina, I should have asked you how to say her last name, Priyamka 
have designed an evaluation on the impact of this pilot on student outcomes. So we're so glad we can amplify their research and Michelle will talk about the outcomes. A paper is forthcoming and LPI will be distributing this paper um, this summer. And for now, we are fortunate to have Michelle live with us to share the um, results from the study they're conducting. Hello all, I, uh, I think I can't, can you hear me? It's saying yep, that I'm- you. Yes, we can hear you, Michelle. The co-host, um, yes, uh -huh. I can't see you yet, though your video is not. Here I come, I okay. believe, maybe, yeah? Yep, there you are. Cool. Hello, everybody. I'm Michelle Fine. Uh, I teach at CUNY, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Monica, Linda, all of the staff for making this possible. Joanna, thank you for making the time. And to all of you in the audience, I hope you are coping well enough with COVID and the violence in um, Minnesota and all the ways in which the current moment is affecting our, our lives. But I think we gather to imagine um, a moment of possibility in difficult times. And so I'm going to sketch the, um, the origin and impact of the pilot in the CUNY system. And um, I encourage you to look at the report for a more de detailed assessment of the data. I need to say that our study emerged out of a, a a uh, significant partnership between K through 12 schools, the consortium schools, the university that is CUNY. Uh, the uh, high school version was initiated by Ann Cook and Phyllis Tashlick from the New York Performance Standards Consortium. Um, the pilot was launched with the bold leadership of interim chancellor Vida Rabinowitz at the City University of New York who was searching for strategies that could braid equity and access. Um, it was launched with the bold leadership of uh, the admissions director, Joanna Kurchaski. And then this assessment comes from a collaboration between myself and Karina Priumka, who's an advanced doctoral student in psychology at the Graduate Center. And she's also a, um, faculty member at Lehman College. Our final report draws from data from the New York City Department of Education, as well as CUNY's databases. And I encourage you to look at the data on the 38 consortium schools, because you will see from those data that young people come into those schools, as Linda said, often at significant disadvantage, high housing precarity, um, larger than citywide rates of English language learners, lower socioeconomic status, um, highly diverse racially and ethnically. They come in slightly below the average for the city in terms of reading and math scores, and yet they graduate at much higher rates of college readiness and gaps between race and class narrow within the consortium schools. Let me also say, before we even get into the data, that as uh, folks have indicated, the consortium schools are organized around a performance assessment system. So this isn't a technique added at the end for college access. As Linda indicated, these young people are growing up in schools that value inquiry, depth, teacher professionalism, and then at the end of their PVATs, they have to present their work to an external examining committee of scientists, people like myself, university professors. So it's, it's a culture immersed in student inquiry, multicultural responsive curriculum, teacher generated um, PVATs and external evaluation. The pilot was born because, as Joanna indicated, there was a moment after 2008 when some of the educators in the consortium schools, particularly the counselors, noticed that young people who used to get into the CUNY four-year schools and were getting into private universities that were SAT optional were no longer getting into those four-year schools and were being um, 
invited to attend community colleges. This was particularly true for Black and, um, and Latino low-income students and a prominent community-based organization, policy organization in New York, the Community Service Society, um, launched a pretty substantial public relations campaign to call CUNY to account for why Black and Latino New York City graduates were decreasingly gaining access to the four-year colleges. CUNY decided to build a pilot. The consortium was involved. I and Karina at the Public Science Project at CUNY, and the pilot was born. What we did with the pilot was, as Joanna indicated, we uh, created a process whereby graduates from consortium schools were doubly vetted. They were vetted at the consortium schools and then by CUNY, assessing their performance-based assessment tasks, teacher recommendations, their GPA, um, and in the pilot, they were permitted to come in below the SAT cutoff, which at CUNY at the time in the four-year colleges was 500 on language arts and mathematics. So we have been systematically tracking these young people over time. We now have three cohorts, and I'm going to give you some preliminary data. I uh, just want to make sure my time is good. Preliminary data in tracking the students. As you can see on this slide, we had two simple research questions. How do students who are educated in the consortium with performance assessments fare over time in terms of college persistence? Uh, GPA and credits accumulated in general and then where possible we wanted to disaggregate the data by race and ethnicity and we were comparing them to CUNY students in general first time first year full-time BA students secondly we were interested in particular in those students in the pilot who scored under as uh, the 500 uh, on the SATs how they fared over time, same outcomes, college persistence, GPAs, and credits accumulated. I'm going to give you an overview of the finding and then we can do a deeper look assuming we have time. Um, I will say we have been delighted at the, at the research and um, let me just say that in the beginning the university agreed to do the pilot in exchange for the fact that we agreed to do a transparent documentation of the impact. Can we get these young people into CUNY and how did they fare? So this was deeply committed to a notion of accountability that the consortium schools were more than willing to undertake. What we have found to date with three cohorts of students is that first year full-time students pursuing a BA in the CUNY pilot, that is, they came in with below cutoff on the SATs, have a higher rate of persistence after one year compared to their peers from New York City public schools. Secondly, is that a higher percentage of these students earn 80% or more of attempted first semester credits. And third is that the students in the pilot have a higher grade point average than their peers. So on those three indicators of academic performance, persistence, credit accumulation, and GPA, the pilot students were outperforming their peers. When we looked at the larger sample of consortium students, which included pilot and non-pilot, we did a disaggregated analysis, particularly for black males, and we found that there was what we're calling a kind of consortium boost Black males who are pursuing the BA at, um, at CUNY who come from consortium schools have a much higher rate of persistence after one year and have higher GPA than their peers in CUNY. So this will give you a sense of the cohorts. The first year was a funky year, happy to answer questions. We were late, the materials weren't clear. So of the 52 who applied, we ended up with 15. 
the numbers have increased over time, number um, applied, number admitted, and uh, the percentage who end up coming to, to CUNY. Um, I think this year we're up to 127 who have applied and 84% have accepted. We don't know yield yet. This is the first year st um, full-time students pursuing a BA in the pilot. Again, the pilot are the young people who scored below the SAT cutoff, doubly vetted in their high schools and at CUNY. And you see after one year, 90, almost 94% uh, um, are coming back. A higher percentage of these students are earning more than 80% of their attempted first semester credits. Again, if you just look at the pilot line, it's almost 89%. And if you look at the GPA, again, you see students in the pilot have a slightly higher than average um, GPA for their first year. I need to tell you also that the students are coming in um, with below SAT um, 500 cutoff. They're also more likely to black, be Black and Latinx than the CUNY general population is. They're less likely to be white and Asian, and they're more likely to be coming from the Bronx. So you're getting a more diverse community of students um, who are uh, achieving at a rate at the level of their peers, if not surpassing it. If we go to the full-time black males, you'll see that for the consortium, 90% of black males are retained after one year compared to 78% of the New York City public schools. Specialized high schools are the highly selective high schools and the consortium African-American males are still outperforming those young people. Uh, same thing with GPA. The implications for equity access and persistence speak to a number of simple findings. One is that our early results reveal encouraging patterns of uh, performance assessments in terms of equity access, credit accumulation, GPA, and persistence. The early evidence on rate race, ethnicity, equity is promising, but as we've said, our sample sizes are small. We're about to get a new data dump about which we're quite excited. The, the pilot offers extremely encouraging evidence that college admission policies rooted in performance assessments can strengthen Ooh. equitable college admissions, achievement, persistence, and eventually we predict graduation. And both the statistical evidence and the interviews we conducted with administrators suggest that even large public universities are beginning to recognize the need and desire to develop the means for more open or holistic admission processes, opening up our universities to more diverse student communities through a multi-metric framework. And I'll end on this note as private universities more than 1,200 move toward test optional admissions. One might ask, is it not the responsibility of public and private universities to develop admission policies that widen access, strengthen equity, and deepen the creative intellectual development of our students? At the moment, because of COVID and the bold moves of the University of California, we, um, we have access to a natural experiment on equity access and higher education. It has been born from a public health crisis. It gives us an opportunity to move toward an ethical, authentic, um, and deeply uh, accessible admissions process. Monica, you're on. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you for the profound kind of charges to us as, as educators, as higher ed and K-12 leaders in this world. Um, we're so excited about the valuation um, and that uh, and that CUNY had the wherewithal to really design a pilot alongside the pilot uh, or a study alongside the pilot. Um, and we're especially excited about the findings showing the promise of performance and admissions to higher education. Um, and we're also really excited about what it says around equity. 
um, and, and the holistic admissions. A uh, few folks have been asking if um, this report will be published, and yes, it will be published. It will probably come out in July. Um, and uh, we will have a summary that's available around the report after this webinar. We'll be emailing it to folks. So just want to reassure everyone about that right away before we move on to Linda Darling Hammond to wrap up this webinar for us. Um, we're seeing a lot of questions. And so Michelle, I'm just going to go forward so we can get to everyone's questions after Linda wraps up. Um, there's a lot of questions right now around um, performance assessment um, and um, as well as scaling. Um, and so we'll move on to Linda wrapping up our webinar and then we'll move into questions and answers with everyone. And I appreciate all of you sticking with us as we now are at the top of the hour and we'll go on for about 15 more minutes. Linda, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Well, I wanna thank you, Michelle, for the fabulous research, the fabulous report and the great um, presentation of the findings. I note in the chat box, if you haven't been able to look while you were talking that Yang Wan Choi has written you a note. Um, uh, you are as inspiring as ever. 21 years ago, as a graduate student who heard you speak in New York City. I love that because Young Wan is now in Oakland leading the performance assessment work in, in that town, which requires a capstone project of all of their seniors and is part of the California Performance Assessment Collaborative, which really learned how to be a collaborative from the New York Performance Standards Consortium. So it's an interesting cross-country um, connection uh, that I love in so many ways. I just want to point out uh, one uh, thing from the wonderful data that Michelle just presented, which is that the persistence rate for the pilot students in CUNY um, is 94% uh, uh, after one year, at the beginning of the sophomore year, which is an extraordinary uh, yeah. persistence rate mm -hmm. um, in a public university for students um, of color who are um, coming from, as Michelle said, um, and we also saw this effect for the number of students from high poverty schools uh, being much more um, pronounced than um, for um, uh, other students. So I think that there's something about these practices that develop what I might think of as academic resilience um, you know, both the finding that you have about the pilot students, about the much higher rates of success of black male students, about students from high poverty schools. Because when you come to college, the question of do I belong, can I do this work, how do I do this work, uh, is a very different question if you've had the experience of doing this kind of work uh, throughout high school, if you've had the opportunity to develop serious research and uh, investigations and refine your work in response to standards and defend your work and learn that you can, in fact, meet the standards and continue to improve your own thinking and your own analysis. Uh, the academic confidence and resilience that that provides, I think, is part of the real storyline here. And that's my, that's my last word. Thank well, you. Linda, yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, I appreciate um, all of the panelists and Linda, Joanna, and Michelle um, for sharing this with everybody. And we are going to move to questions and answers now. And, um, and like I said, we've been getting lots of great questions. We've received some interesting ones. We'll have time to talk about a few of those. Some folks gave me the name and affiliation, so hopefully I can attribute the um, questions to the proper person. Um, I'm going to start off a little bit with the performance assessment piece, um, Linda. There's been very related questions around um, kind of the timing of performance assessment, the um, kind of objectivity that is used in performance assessment. Um, one person asked, do parents help the students and therefore give them a leg up, so to speak? Um, so maybe if you can talk a little bit about how performance assessment is embedded. Um, in the classrooms, and I think some folks are seeing this as kind of very traditional end of the course, end of the year. One person asked if it's um, like the SAT and ACT, is it offered during certain times of the year? So maybe if you could talk a little bit more about performance assessment, but we certainly have questions for Joanna and Michelle as well. Yeah, and I was going to invite Michelle to offer some comments on this too, because she has been tracking this process for many years as well in terms of what goes on in the schools. Um, and of course, this is really embedded in everything the students are doing, uh, that you know, their work is 
um, continually uh, organized around investigation research, writing and communicating to a standard, you know, revising their work. Um, and so that's just the way that education is done in the consortium schools and in many other schools that are involved in this kind of deep approach to um, both project-based inquiry-based learning and performance assessment. And so uh, it's um, not something that happens at testing time. It's not something that happens at the end of the course. It's not something that happens only in senior year. It's a process of learning to think and inquire and evaluate and uh, you know, apply evidence over a long period of time. Uh, you know, the question about whether, you know, in, in particularly in the families that we're talking about in this performance assessment consortium, you know, a lot of uh, uh, families are, um, you know, working two jobs, are, you know, not, didn't graduate from high school themselves, um, are not, you know, going to be there doing the students' work for them. But I do think that there are other contexts within which we do this kind of work goes on in school uh, where, uh, it is quite possible to frame the work such that it is the student's work and it is their ability to take the feedback and revise the work and meet the standards that is uh, being uh, assessed. Michelle, do you want to add anything uh, on that score? Two quickly. Yeah. Am I good? Yeah. yeah. Um, two quick thoughts. Um, this tends not to be the crowd who has the over-involved parent who's writing the paper for them. That's us. <laughs> that, 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 that's not who's attending these schools for the most part. But I have sat on um, at uh, performance assessment roundtables where there is presentation and there have been parents on the roundtable. So the young people have to present their work you know, a 25-page paper comparing two genres of literature or a moment in history with um, where an ethical debate was being undertaken or a science experiment. They have to write it. They present it to the reviewers who are teachers outside, like academics or scientists or business or politicians. And I've seen par parents on that. And then we interrogate. And I have been on beautiful um, uh, panels where you can't believe the work is so gorgeous. And I've been on panels where we say, Linda, you're going to be great, but your book's not quite ready, or the text isn't ready, or your science experiment needs a little help. And nobody runs out of the room saying, oh my god, I failed. They take the feedback, they revise. And, it, and, and they redefend. It's a, it's a beautiful community of feedback, revision, intellectual growth. And when Laurie Chage, I'm happy to see it, the citations in the report, when Laurie Chage followed consortium students into college, she found not only higher persistence rates, but three big distinctions. One is they know how to write a paper. They were so surprised that their... Um, their roommates were flipped out about writing a paper. Second, when they hit a bump in the road, they find someone to help them. They trust adults. And a lot of kids, just as Linda said, who feel like maybe I don't belong to college anyway, they hit a bump in the road and they exit. These kids find somebody at the college or somebody at their high school. And the third thing is that they know how to revise. They know how to take feedback and revise, which feels to me like a lost skill of the 20th century. Um, so I, I think the culture builds that. I like that you call it academic resilience um, because I think they learn how to navigate and navigate with an idea toward inquiry and their own intellectual signature, not just compliance and taking notes. That's great. I'm going to um, do a follow-up question, really, that builds on both of what you and Linda asked, uh, were talking about. And, and Joanna, it's, it's back to you. And really, one of the things I heard you say when you were looking at the performance assessment is you really could um, see some of those critical thinking skills and problem-solving skills when you looked at student work. And so one of the questions that came in was, and, and again, it's um, about kind of objectivity and subjectivity. 
But one of the um, audience members asked, um, do you worry about the subjectivity of, of, of certain readers, you know, in terms of your admission staff? And, and how do you kind of um, calibrate for that um, as an admissions officer? It's certainly done, you know, within these schools that use performance assessment, but as an admissions person, how do you kind of calibrate the objectivity of what you guys are looking at and integrating that into your decision? Yeah, so, so for, for this pilot, we had um, two admissions readers take a look at the performance assessment of each individual, um, and then we would compare to see whether or not we shared in our assessment of, of the work. Um, and so I think that helped us internally be a little bit more objective in our final decision. Um, you know, again, there is, um, I, I think I wanted to second that, you know, what Michelle and Linda had said, uh, that the work that we're seeing, um, it, it's quite evident that this is an ongoing project that students really put a lot of effort into. And so, so while there are different disciplines that are being covered um, and different materials that we're seeing throughout our assessment, um, you know, unanimously, I think we all agreed that, that we are seeing work that has uh, been thoughtfully compiled together. And so, um, and so that's very important to us as well. Great. And then so I, add, add a thought, but go ahead and finish yours. Uh, just one other follow-up question to you, jo Joanna, was um, what's your advice to admissions offices or the enrollment, you know, managers and deans, um, if they were to, you know, move into this kind of direction, use performance assessment as part of their holistic review, what would you say are some of the first things they might need to do? I, I think initially just get some familiarity with performance assessments um, to understand how the work looks um, and that work doesn't always mean that it's an essay. So similar to Michelle, I've, I've also sat on a couple of round tables in the past couple of years. Um, and that has helped me and a couple of my staff understand the type of work that happens with performance assessments. But, but I think um, number one, understand what it is that you're measuring, figure out how to measure it. Um, and then see if you can work with the institutions to, to set up some type of a, a standard. I, I think uh, the, the key to making this work and to making this work at scale is to work collaboratively with the institutions, figure out what is being graded, what is being presented with some of these performance assessments so that we have a meaningful way to track some of this information to see if there are any particular indicators that are po pointing to student persistence and student success. Um, you know, to, to that end, we, we still have a long ways to go. We, we implemented this pilot in 2015. Um, it really took off in 2016. Michelle um, shared some of those results. We are now starting to incorporate some of those results and, and, and thinking about the, the next steps of, of streamlining some of the work that we've done. That's great. Um, can I just add to that point? Um, you know, one of the things that um, uh, Joanna mentioned is that it's very important for the work to arrive with the rubrics so that you know mm -hmm. what it has been evaluated on. And uh, obviously you want to train people to be able to read that work. But uh, in many cases, it's also a function of can you trust the scores that come in with the work that have already been scored and are using the rubrics. In the case of the New York Performance Standards Consortium, there is moderated scoring that goes on across schools during the summertime where people come together and score work as they would if you were an AP um, scorer on the AP uh, essay um, uh, elements, or if you were uh, working in the International Baccalaureate, you would learn and get calibrated in your scoring to a common standard. That is true in a number of schools that have developed very thoughtful, well-developed portfolio systems. Um, I think of um, Envision Education, I think of the Link Learning Schools that are working on this, I think about the work that's going on in Oakland that I mentioned earlier, uh, and a number of other places where um, 
there's a system, there's a set of well-defined rubrics, there's a calibration process for staff. And what universities would want to know is that that system has gone on. What is the assessment system? Uh, how has it been scored? We accept uh, the scores on the AP, including their capstone and inquiry courses that are all projects and performance tasks. Uh, we accept the scores on the International Baccalaureate, which is primarily papers and projects scored by teachers because we know what goes into it. We know what the process is. So as the, this gets developed, being able to have a high confidence process and a knowledge base about what the competencies are that are being evaluated, how they're being evaluated, what the evaluations are, can allow people both to accept the work, but also just to accept the judgments that have been made if the process meets a high standard of rigor. So I think there are a lot of ways to think about it. The mastery transcript consortium has a way that you can see the work that students have done um, associated with um, the competencies they're trying to measure, how the, how the students did on those competencies, their you know, courses and, and grades and, and so on, but also the um, uh, standards and the uh, pieces of work related to those. So I think, as Joanne has said, we need to develop systems that convey the work in a usable and understandable form with a level of assurance about what is behind it, as well as then helping people uh, in admissions figure out how to use it efficiently as well as effectively. And I think we now have a study of the predictive validity of these assessments so that questions about subjectivity and objectivity get kind of um, turned on their head now that we can demonstrate that young people brought in and, and we're just growing the samples, so we'll have more and more data for you. But um, at the young people come in with a complex, thoughtful process, but then even using just quantitative uh, measures, whether it's GPA, credit accumulation, or persistence, um, we can see that they are faring as well, if not better than their peers. I know you wanna go, we gotta go, thank you. Monica. No, no, you don't have to go quite yet, but I do wanna to, um, to thank you, but also Michelle, also thank you again for ending on that profound note around the predictive validity and, and the potential. And so I just, you know, we, we have a couple more minutes, but I can't thank, thank the three of you for the valuable information, the questions that are coming in around performance assessment, the use of such in college admissions um, at CUNY to support equitable access and success. Um, and, and Joanna, again, thank you for sharing your lessons learned and some of that will be captured in the paper that we are publishing. And we do really look at CUNY as, as our North Star. Uh, we have questions around people asking about how does the University of California integrate some of this work. And so I'm sorry we won't be able to get to all of them, but I think what this webinar shows is we're just really starting to generate some evidence about the potential use of using high quality performance assessment in admissions thanks to CUNY's um, and thanks to the Graduate Center's study. Um, it's the right time for higher education to recognize and value performance assessment in high school. We've had a lot of questions about what's the impact of COVID. Well, again, this is the right time as so many schools are starting to integrate test optional and holistic. But we believe that performance assessment will help colleges and universities more equitably and holistically review their candidates specific to a broad set of competencies and alignment to their mission and to ensure students can succeed at their campus. I'm gonna, um, as our next webinar will actually take off from this. It's part of a series, Reimagining College Access and Success. It will be on June 23rd. It's gonna be called Performance Assessment in College Admissions, How Students Show What They Know and Can Do. It is purposely designed to take off where this one ended. Our panelists will include Scott Anderson, Senior Director and Board at Common App, a major partner with RCA, Judy Purdy, Director of Admissions for Wheaton College, who piloted the use of performance assessments this past year, and Stu Schmill, Dean of Admissions and Student Financial Aid Services for MIT, who's been using performance assessment for a few years now. A recording of this webinar, as well as a webinar summary and all of the resources we've shared today will be sent out to everyone via email in a few days. We'll also be releasing the study this summer and we'll also send that out via email. Please feel free to share any of the resources with your colleagues. And finally, I'd like to mention that a survey will appear in your window when you leave this webinar and we'd appreciate your feedback. 
I know we went a little bit over time. Thank you for taking the time to join Thank us today. You. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your questions. And most of all, your commitment to reimagining college access and success. We hope you'll have a wonderful day. And please let us know how we can support your work. Thank you for all of the participants. Bye-bye.